Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We really appreciate it. You know, there was some traffic issues and whatnot. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Debbie Brown, Director of Operations with IDPF. And we have some really exciting news. We have a new Executive Director, Lori Butler, whom most of you probably have met, since this is such a small group, she's been talking about them. She does have, um, uh, we do have an event coming up later this month um, that is very exciting. Is running this event, and she'd like to share a little bit about herself and also um, our event here in San Diego. Well, I did go out and meet a lot of you, so thank you for, um, for introducing yourselves to me. I really appreciate it. Um, I think I already took a survey. How many people, if I were to take it again, you don't have to raise your hand, how many people this is their first time being here? I would raise my hand. This is my first time being at one of our lecture series. And um, I'm delighted to be here. I've been um, on board since August 17th. I've run nonprofit organizations for 25 years, um, including the ALS Association for People with Garrett's Disease, um, uh, International Membership Organ Service Community Organization, uh, Boys and Girls Clubs, Girls Inc., all kinds of um, different organizations, but I'm really um, happy to have found a home with the Bipolar Foundation. I have a 19-year-old son um, who's got bipolar disorder, and he was last um, hospitalized in December, um, and he's uh, doing okay, um, but um, I'm here tonight to listen as well as to how to find <laughs> someone that he can relate to, because he's not, he's 19, and he's not, um, not really come to terms with everything. That he will. Um, anyway, we have um, some really exciting things coming up. This um, lecture series, since all of you are new, I'll explain. Um, we do this about four times a year, right, Debbie? And the reason why you're helping other people beyond yourself from being here tonight, because we put the lecture series on, and he takes just the speakers, and then we put it up on the internet, and it helps people all around the world. So uh, not only are you here gathering information for yourself, but because you decided to come tonight, we can help other people who will be uh, sharing, hearing this wonderful information. We do webinars. Um, we have things like a mental health patch for Girl Scouts. We have a whole bunch of unique programs that other organizations aren't doing. Um, somebody did ask me to explain how we were founded. We have four founding members. Um, they were all women, and they're not, uh, they're not here tonight. They were moms like me, but um, they were people who had great resources, um, monetarily connections. One was even a psychiatric nurse. And they had four children who were diagnosed with bipolar disorder at a time when even the medical community was saying that couldn't possibly be. So they started gathering up resources for themselves and found it, like most of you, it was a full-time job, um, gathering up those resources. And then they said, we have the means and the connections and the, um, we want to help other people. So they started the California Bipolar Foundation. And then they started getting requests from people around the world. And they are a group of ladies who just don't say no. And they decided to change the name to International Bipolar Foundation. So we've been around since 2007. We're expanding. We're doing new things. Debbie's a big, big part of that. Um, she's our uh, director of operations, and she runs all of the programs and keeps our finances straight and all kinds of wonderful things. Um, but that's kind of the background of where um, where we're at. Over there on the table, you can see the book standing up. If you don't have that, um, do get it. It's available in different languages. Um, we have a webinar series that Debbie puts. We have twice a month. Um, but one of the most exciting things that we've been doing for the last four years is running in the Carlsbad Marathon. We have another group of people that, you ju that just don't say no. Um, they have friends and relatives um, and themselves. Some of the people running um, have bipolar disorder. And this year, we have somebody really famous who has bipolar disorder who's asked, she asked us if she could run for us. Um, her name is Susie Faber Hamilton. There's a big poster over there with her picture on it. Um, but she's a three-time Olympian. And she just released her book called Fast Girl. And um, I think you can get from the title of the book that it does involve some pretty racy topics that I won't go into. But um, basically, her misdiagnosis with depression and then taking medication only for depression sent her into a mania that took her into a lifestyle that was very far from being an Olympic athlete. And she was exposed in the media, um, literally, and lost all of her um, a lot of her promotions, a lot of her friends, and her good name. But since 2013, she's been living healthy. She's got a bipolar diagnosis. She's taking the right medication. 
Um, she's still running, but I was delighted I had lunch with her the other day. I had the wonderful opportunity to have lunch, and she looked at me, she said, you know, I really haven't liked running. I was an art major in college, and what I really want to do is just teach art in my daughter's class. So I would encourage you to come. It's a free event. Uh, we're having it at Dave & Buster's the Tuesday um, before Thanksgiving. I believe that's November 24th. And um, absolutely free. Um, we are there to raise awareness and try to raise um, funds. But um, awareness is most important to us, and then the fundraising comes second. So um, we're different from other organizations. So I encourage you to come to that, and you'll be inspired by her story. Um, there will be a lot of people on our staff, a lot of other people who can um, directly help and answer even more questions if you're here tonight. So I think that's really all I have to say. Um, sorry for taking so much time, but um, I just wanted to um, let you know about that one uh, really great event. And then I guess I should mention in May, if you know of anybody who um, likes going to galas, that's our number big number one fundraiser that we we do. Um, but that's how we provide these programs for people all over the world. So. Keep that. It's May 7th. It's the day before my birthday. So uh, feel free to Facebook me on, on that day. But, uh, but anyway, thank you so much for being here. It's an encouragement to me and to our organization. And I know you're going to get a lot out tonight. So I'm Eunice Kim. I am um, actually a recent transplant from Los Angeles where I taught at UCLA for about 10 years um, and worked in the uh, bipolar programs there. Uh, now I teach at UCSD, and I have a private practice here in Carmel Valley where I see children, adolescents, and adults um, with mood disorders, anxiety disorders, substance abuse. Um, and I'm here because I know that trying to find a good therapist or the right therapist can be frustrating, overwhelming, confusing, take some trial and error. And I'm hoping to provide you know just a little bit of information that will help you in your search. Um, what I'm going to do first is talk about different types of therapy that are available, not just for bipolar disorder, but for a wider range of problems. Um, so the information will be relevant to anyone who has experience with bipolar disorder, but also relevant to anyone who has struggled with anxiety, um, substance abuse problems, um, difficult family relationships, because uh, bipolar disorder rarely exists kind of on its own. Um, so I'll first review therapies that have significant research support behind them and then briefly discuss an older generation of therapies that you still are likely to come across um, even though they haven't received as much research attention. Um, uh, after I go through the different types of therapies I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what to look for in a therapist and a relationship with a therapist. And uh, if you have questions along the way, we'll be, we'll be talking questions at the end. So just as a disclaimer today, this, the stuff I'm going to talk about today is really only the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot of different types of therapy out there, and there are a lot of things that people can look for in a therapist. I've selected um, just the type of therapies that have significant research support behind them, but are also kind of more commonly available. Some of the things up here are, are a little bit harder to find. Um, and, but also I've selected ones that I felt would be more most relevant to this audience. Um, and my hope is just to introduce you to some terms and ideas that you may be unfamiliar with and that you can kind of take and do some research on your own, you know, on the internet or um, yeah, along those lines. So just, you know, I'm hoping this will be kind of a guide and a starting point. So when you um, start, a lot of times people, when they start their search for a therapist, they'll go online or they'll call places like the International Bipolar Foundation and um, you know get some names of people who might be geographically convenient, maybe take their insurance. Uh, but you can still end up with a long list of names and it's hard to know, you know how do you choose from there. So I usually recommend kind of first figuring out what kind of therapy will be most helpful for what's happening, for what someone is struggling with right now. Um, and then figure out which therapists offer that kind of therapy, and then you can start making phone calls and trying to schedule some appointments. 
Okay, so which is why I'm first going to talk about different types of therapy. Um, as I said, I'll, I'm going I'm to focus on the ones listed here. I'm uh, focus primarily on ones that have been proven effective in research studies. These are not the only types of therapy that have been proven effective in research, but like I said, they're the ones that are easier to find and um, what I thought would be most relevant for today. So I'm going to start with talking about cognitive behavioral therapy. Has anybody heard of cognitive behavioral therapy? Yeah, some of you? Okay. Um, it was developed, I'll call it CBT, it was developed by a man named Aaron Beck in the 1960s and it's based on the premise that um, the thoughts we have about a situation determine how we feel about the situation. And when our thoughts are distorted or skewed often, we're more likely to feel depressed or anxious. So CBT focuses on changing a person's thinking style or thought pattern. Um, so to give you an example, this is a picture that I'll often show children. And I'll ask them, what's happening in this picture? And most of them actually will be able to say, well, one of the cats is probably happy and excited for the dog to wake up. And the other cat is not happy and scared. And they're able to understand that the two cats have very different emotions because they have very different thoughts about the situation. Um, the goal of CBT is not really to get people to always think positively. It's to get people to identify when their thoughts might be distorted and figure out if there is a more objective way of looking at the situation. So to give you another example, um, let's say you get an email from your boss that says, let's schedule a meeting for tomorrow. There are some changes I'd like to, to the report you sent. And one person might think, I'm always making mistakes. I'm so worthless. And the feelings that result are usually, are, you know, we might be sadness, anxiety. And the behaviors that result from those feelings would be maybe isolating, moping, not going to work the next day. A second person might think, he's such a jerk. He always picks on my work. And the feelings that result are going to be probably anger, frustration, and the behaviors that result from those feelings might be defensiveness, irritability in the meeting the next day, possibly. And then a third person might think, hmm, I guess I'll learn some things that will help me write a better report next time. And this person will feel probably neither good nor bad, but fairly content that person can still go home, enjoy their dinner, and have a productive meeting with their boss the next day. So you can see how different thoughts about a situation um, can lead, lead to different emotions and behaviors. So CBT helps people identify when they're having thoughts that are leading to problematic um, emotions and behaviors and teaches them to replace these thoughts with um, hopefully more objective ones. So CBT is time limited. It's often three to six months, sometimes longer, depending on uh, the person's needs. Um, it's mostly focused on the present, so most of the discussion is going to be on what's happening in your life now rather than childhood or the distant past. Um, it's also more focused on teaching skills and problem solving, so it's best for people who are looking for practical ways to reduce depression and anxiety um, and people who are kind of willing to practice things outside of their therapy sessions. There are uh, different variations of CBT. There's, you know, there's a variation for OCD, a different variation for panic or phobias, um, a different version for depression or generalized anxiety. Um, so you can always ask a therapist if they have experience using CBT um, for the specific problem that you're struggling with. It is considered by many people to be the first line therapy intervention anyway for depression and anxiety and that's based on just a, a large number of studies showing effectiveness for both depression and anxiety disorders. So next is um, what's called dialectical behavior therapy, uh, which was originally developed by a woman named Marsha Linehan uh, to, for the treatment of borderline personality disorder. 
but it is now used much more widely. It's very often recommended for emotional dysregulation, meaning um, uh, you know, very extreme, unpredictable emotions, um, moods that fluctuate very frequently. It's also very often the first line therapy for uh, people who have chronic suicidal behavior or self-harming behavior. Um, and it's also been shown more recently to be effective in treating substance uh, substance use problems and as, uh, and eating disorders. So for someone who's depressed and has been depressed for several weeks, maybe several months, and depression is a fairly consistent mood, um, and there's not a lot of you know recurrent suicidal behavior, I am likely to recommend cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. For someone who's depressed and um, frequently su switches from depressed and suicidal to angry and irritable and threatening to hurt themselves if their boyfriend leaves and then is elated when the boyfriend comes back and then depressed again a couple days later for no identifiable reason. For someone like this, I'm more likely to recommend DBT uh, because there's more emotional dysregulation. So DBT, like CBT, is um, focused on skills, but slightly different skills. CBT focuses on changing a person's thought patterns and thinking style, whereas DBT focuses on four general um, groups of skills. Um, it first teaches mindfulness, and mindfulness is actually a form of meditation that focuses on being very uh, on being fully aware of the present moment. And I'm actually going to say more about mindfulness later because it's um, a component of other types of therapy as well. So for now, I'm just going to say, just know that it's part of DBT, uh, and I'll say more about it later. Um, it, DBT teaches distress tolerance, um, meaning it teaches people how to tolerate pain in difficult situations without trying to change it. So oftentimes when people are upset, angry, anxious, they will go to drugs or self-harming behavior to try to decrease these feelings. And learning distress tolerance helps people write out painful or uncomfortable feelings instead of trying to change the way they feel with again, drugs, gambling, sex, um, other behaviors that can cause a lot of problems in people's lives. And then it teaches interpersonal effectiveness. Um, so often people don't know how to ask for what they want. Some people you know, don't ask for anything at all and become resentful. Um, some people ask too aggressively, kind of pushing people away. Some people ask for help using um, self-harming behavior or suicidal gestures because uh, they don't know how else to ask for help. Um, other times people don't know how to say no and uh, makes it very difficult for them to maintain self-respect. Um, some people, on the other hand, say no too aggressively, again, pushing people away. So DBT teaches people how to interact more effectively with others while maintaining self-respect. And then lastly, um, it teaches emotion regulation. This skill teaches people how to manage very negative emotions and increase positive emotions. So for people who become very easily overwhelmed by negative emotions, um, this skill can help them kind of let go of their emotions more easily and take actions to kind of decrease their emotional suffering. So that's, that's CBT in a very brief nutshell. Um, what I wanted, to, I, I, what I want to say about mindfulness is, um, first of all, it's recommend. It's often, very often, recommended for anxiety and depression and emotion dysregulation. Um, it's actually a form of meditation, but I like to think of it as a skill or a tool that can be practiced and learned. One expert has described mindfulness as paying attention in a particular way on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So to give you an example, because it's hard to know what that means, most of us, when we're eating, we eat unmindfully. We are aware that we're eating, 
but um, we might be talking, watching TV, reading, maybe doing all three. And only a very small part of our minds is focused on the taste and feel of the food. If we're eating mindfully, um, we would be paying very close attention to how the food feels in our mouths, um, the sounds it makes, the sounds we make when we chew, the sensations that we have when we're swallowing. Um, it would be very aware of what was happening in the present moment. And as we were trying, as we were, as we're trying to eat mindfully, um, I might, my, our minds will naturally wander away from the present moment. So I might have the thought, I wonder what I'm gonna have for dessert. And so my mind has wandered into the future. And then my next thought might be, oh, I have to get gas on my way to work tomorrow. And so then my mind has wandered further into the future. And then my next thought is, oh, gas is so expensive. And then I'm annoyed. And, and I'm further and further away from what's happening in the present moment. And our minds can just as easily wander to the past. So I might have the thought, oh, my office mate didn't say much to me today. I wonder if I said something wrong. Um, and then my next thought might be, you know, my boss didn't uh, say much to me at that meeting yesterday. I wonder if people are unhappy with my work. And on and on that thought, those thoughts go until anxiety starts to grow. And so mindfulness teaches people to be aware of when their thoughts have wandered away from the present moment and bring it back to the present. And the important thing about mindfulness is that it also teaches us to be non-judgmental about our experience. So it teaches people not to judge their experience as bad or good, but just to notice what is. So if I'm feeling depressed, it's easy to judge this as bad. I might think, oh, I hate feeling so depressed. This is not good for my health. Why do I feel depressed again? I can't stand it. So if a first person feels depressed and then judges this as very bad, the feelings only become worse. Mindfulness teaches us to be aware of feeling depressed without judging it. So with mindfulness, the stream of thought might be more like, I feel depressed, my energy is low, I'm crying a lot. And these are just statements of fact. They're just observations about what's going on. There's no judgment involved. Um, so they don't add a layer of anger and frustration that just makes things worse. And um, taking away the judgment allows us to be less reactive and allows us to have a little more stillness uh, and calm. So what I want to do actually is when therapists teach mindfulness, they often start with teaching mindfulness of the breath. And to give you a sense of what this looks like, uh, I'm going to play an excerpt of a guided mindfulness meditation just so you can have a sense of what learning mindfulness might be like and, and, and you can get a sense of whether it might be helpful for you. So hopefully this will work. You can sit comfortably on a cushion or in a chair. Yeah, and I'd like you to just kind of follow along and try to do it as she, as she talks. See if you can keep your back erect, but without being strained or overarched. And if you can't sit, you can lie on your back on a yoga mat or folded blanket with your arms at your sides. You can close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. If not, or you're more familiar with meditating with your eyes open, that's fine. With eyes open, you can gaze gently a few feet in front of you, find a spot, rest your gaze. You can deliberately take three or four deep breaths Feel the air as it enters your nostrils, fills your chest and abdomen, and then flows out again. Then let your breath settle into its natural rhythm without forcing it or trying to control it. Just feel the breath as it happens without trying to change it or improve it. Notice where you feel your breath most vividly, most predominantly. Maybe it's the in and out movement of air at the nostrils. Maybe it's the rising, falling movement of the chest or the abdomen. 
You can find that place, bring your attention there, and just rest. Rest your attention lightly, the way a butterfly rests on a flower, and see if you can feel just one breath without concern for what's already gone by, without leaning forward for even the very next breath. Just this one. Be aware of the sensations of the breath. If you're at the nostrils, for example, you may feel tingling, vibration, warmth, coolness. If you're at the abdomen or the chest, you may feel movement, pressure, stretching, release. You don't need to name these sensations, but feel them. Okay, so mindfulness, um, it isn't exactly a type of therapy, um, but it's been incorporated into multiple other types of therapy, uh, some of which I've listed here. Acceptance and commitment therapy, sometimes called ACT, um, DBT, which I mentioned, uh, there's a program, a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction and Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Behavior Therapy. I'm not going to go into all of these, but you can you know, sort of write these terms down and uh, do some research on them if you think that mindfulness might be helpful. Um, you can always ask a therapist if they teach mindfulness. And there's actually classes um, sometimes. Sometimes you can get learn mindfulness through classes. I'm pretty sure Scripps offers one. I think it's scripts. Um, and as I said, uh, mindfulness has been shown to be pretty effective for depression as well as anxiety. One study actually showed that it might be even as effective as medication for addressing depression, symptoms of depression. Okay, so next I'd like to talk about family focused therapy, FFT. Um, F the FFT is something that I do in my private practice, but I'm only going to talk about briefly because it's not quite as easily available as the other therapies that I've mentioned. Um, but I did want to include it because it's one of the few few therapies that have focused heavily on bipolar disorder specifically. Um, it was it's developed by David McLoitz and uh, usually is about 12 to 16 sessions with three modules. Um, the, in the first module, individuals with bipolar disorder and their family members um, learn about the symptoms of bipolar disorder and the strategies for managing it. And the individuals with bipolar disorder are, are encouraged to talk about their experience with symptoms. And the family members are encouraged to talk about what it's like for them when their loved one is experiencing or struggling with symptoms. Um, and the family as a whole, not just the individual, is taught strategies for preventing relapse, reducing risk factors, and other techniques for just managing the illness as a family. And after the family has received educational information about managing bipolar disorder, FFT focuses on communication skills. So family members learn and practice different ways of expressing positive emotions, of listening to each other, of making requests of each other, and um, expressing negative feelings as well. And this is with the hope that improving communication decreases conflict in the family, which will lead to fewer symptoms or less struggle with symptoms. And then in the third module, family members learn and practice collaborative problem-solving skills uh, so they can resolve their differences more effectively. Um, and again, this is with the idea that solving problems more effectively will mean less conflict between the family members, which will mean fewer symptoms. And this is also, FFT is also kind of a skills-oriented therapy and um, has been shown to be effective in multiple studies with adults as well as children and adolescents. So the therapies that I've described are what are called evidence-based treatments because they have been subject to research and shown to be effective. In the world of psychology, evidence-based research is 
um, evidence-based treatments are relatively new. Um, there is an older generation of therapies that have, like I said, not received much attention from researchers, um, but you'll still come across them because there was a time when pretty much all therapists were trained in what I'm going to just generally call psychodynamic therapies. Um, and I'm going to use the term psychodynamic fairly loosely to include what's called psychoanalysis or Jungian analysis. I don't know how many of you have heard of these terms, but um, you know, even though they're they're older, but you'll still come across them quite often. Um, so if you meet a therapist or, or you come across a therapist who practices psychodynamic therapy um, or psychoanalysis or Jungian analysis, they're going to be much more concerned with your past, especially childhood. And they'll want to understand how childhood experiences are influencing the problems that you're experiencing today. There will be more digging up of memories that you may have you know, not thought of in a very long time, more digging up of the past. You may also be asked to record dreams that the therapist will help you interpret. And psychodynamic therapies are not as popular with insurance companies because um, they're not as short term. They're not typically completed in three to six months. Some people are in psychoanalysis for years. Um, and it's also, psychodynamic therapies are less skills oriented and problem solving focused, um, less focused on kind of practical solutions. But that's not to say that they're not, that's not to say that psychodynamic therapy can't be helpful or that it's not important. If you're someone who doesn't necessarily feel like you need a new skill set or a new set of tools, but there are a lot of things about your past that you don't understand or that you haven't worked through, then psychodynamic therapy um, could be something that could be very helpful. So I'm going to move on to talking about what to look for in a therapist, separate from the type of therapy that they might practice. And many therapists practice more than one. Um, but anyway, moving on to what to look for in a therapist, I'm going to start with a clip. Let's see if I can get it up there. We're going to skip that. <laughs> um, okay. Well, okay, we'll skip the video. And I want to say that um, some, of the, some of the important things to look for in a therapist First is a good fit, and having a good fit actually has very little to do with a therapist's credentials. Um, it has more to do with simply the feeling that you get being with, being with the therapist. You want to feel comfortable, um, and a good fit means that something about your personality just clicks with something about their personality, and it makes it a little bit easier to talk about things that are very difficult to talk about. And sometimes you'll know right away whether it's a good fit, but sometimes it may take a few visits. So I always encourage people to meet with therapists a few times, um, maybe shop around, meet with multiple therapists to figure out who you know they feel the most comfortable with. I, I will say that it's usually easier to know when something is not a good fit. When it's not a good fit, people usually know right away. Um, but you don't always know right away when it is a good fit. Sometimes it can take a few times. And you also want a therapist who makes you feel understood. And this means that the therapist should have expertise in the area that you're looking for help with. But you want to feel like the therapist has an understanding not just of the disorder, but of how you struggle with the disorder. So 
you want a therapist you know, who doesn't talk more than you do and is really listening to what you have to say. Um, and the next is pacing. A good therapist will kind of push you outside of your comfort zone um, to help you grow. And, but not at a pace that you're not ready for. So it needs to be a pace that you're comfortable with. So you'll want a therapist who can accept feedback from you and make adjustments accordingly. Um, you, want to, you want to be able to say to your therapist, no, I think you're wrong about this, or I didn't like when you said this or that. And you want to be able to have a productive discussion about it without the therapist being defensive or being critical of you. Um, I will say there are some exceptions to these, to these guidelines, um, and that's when we're talking about children and adolescents. Most children and adolescents do not like therapy. Um, they will say that the therapist is horrible, that it's not helping, that it's uncomfortable, um, and be dragged kicking and screaming sometimes to their sessions. And that is not necessarily an indication that the therapist can't help. So it is up to you as the parent to kind of figure out if it seems like a good fit, if the therapist seems to understand what the child is struggling with, if the therapist is going at a good pace, and if the therapist is responsive to criticism, um, to constructive criticism. And it can be tricky because parents aren't always in every session or in a lot of the sessions. Um, so you want to work with a therapist who will involve you to the degree that you feel comfortable. Um, I mean, there's a lot that I often can't share with parents in order to maintain the trust of the adolescent, especially. Um, but I will always, I mean, I will fairly regularly have a, still spend some time with the, with the parents so that you as the parent kind of know how things are progressing. And you shouldn't be in the dark about some of the variables. You know that are listed up here. Um, I had another video, but I don't think this one's going to work either. Yeah. Okay. Um, that video was actually of uh, Marshall Linehan, who developed DBT, doing some therapy with a man with, who was suicidal and very angry about his uh, girlfriend leaving him. Um, and uh, it's very obvious in the clip that he doesn't want to change his ways, even though he's quite disturbed. Um, but I, I wanted to end with that clip to make a few comments about therapy more generally. Therapy can be powerful, and it can be transforming, and it can be healing, but it is oftentimes very painful. And it's painful for people, even for people who are not all that disturbed. Um, and I say that because the, the man in the video, you, you know, if you had seen it, was, is very obviously disturbed. Um, so in your search for a therapist, you will want to find someone who will guide you through a process of change. And change takes work. And so this means a good therapist will help you see things about yourself that you don't really like seeing and help you change things that you didn't really think you needed to change or maybe even wanted to change. So if you find yourself seeing a therapist and it feels like a bit of work, not more work than, not too much work, not more work than you're comfortable with, but feels like a bit of work, um, then you're probably in the right place. Um, if the work is being done with a therapist that's giving you empathy, patience, but firmness when needed, then again, you probably are in the right place. And you may even be pleasantly surprised um, with some of the things that you discover along the way. But it's, it's not an easy process. Um, so I hope you'll take some of the information I've given about different types of therapy and do more internet research for yourself. Um, look up some of the terms that sound like they uh, might be a good fit for you. And then you can use some of the online databases, um, some of them I've listed here. Look for the therapists who provide that kind of therapy and then um, set up some meetings.
Okay, so I, I'm not sure what time it is, but the videos were seven, seven o'clock. Okay, so um, we have some time for questions. Yes. Um, I have a very um, kind of specific question. Uh -huh. It'll be a little lengthy to get out, but um, looking for a therapist um, for my daughter, and she's diagnosed with bipolar general anxiety disorder um, and OCD, mm -hmm. um, and she's quite disturbed, <laughs> as you would say, probably the man in the video was. Um, one of her obsessions has uh, become uh, gender dysphoria, mm -hmm. which is something that was, you know, uh, not apparent as a child, and not apparent until the onset of, of bipolar. Both How old is your daughter? <laughs> she's twenty. She's twenty now. Okay. Um, and she was diagnosed a couple of years ago, um, but was symptomatic probably for the past five years. Um, so we've been. A, she's seeing a psychiatrist at UCSD and also a therapist. Um, she's been through a COG program at Sharp Mesa Vista. She was inpatient there. Um, and I believe in, in spending a lot of time with her, we're very close. Um, the gender dysphoria is one of the major components where her brain kind of gets off track and, and needs to be treated. Her, her psychiatrist, um, is trying, you know, she's treatment refractory to a lot of medications. She's currently on four antipsychotics and um, some other meds. Um, and she has some physical problems as well. So bottom line is that um, when I look over gender dysphoria and both in the media and, and you know, other sources of information on it, to me, there seems to be, it's a mismatch of the mind and the body. So the mind and the body do not agree on the gender, mm -hmm. to write to put it simply. And so I see four outcomes in, in that situation. One is you work on the mind's perception of the body, which would be in the psychology field. The other is you change the body, like Bruce Jenner did. You just you know change hormones and try and change your body. The other one would be change both. So you, you get therapy and you start hormones and you do all those things. And the fourth would be you change neither, right? You just do nothing and suffer. Um, the doing nothing option is kind of out because she's suicidal from the bipolar and, and, and other parts of the ailment. She can't change her body because the hormones are contraindicated with um, her other medications for heart problems and, and other problems. So we're left with changing both or working on the mind. And so I've been trying to find a therapist and I call you know, the different gender therapists and there seems to be uh, uh, only a single school of thought in gender therapy and that is to, or gender dysphoria therapy and that is to help the person transition to the gender that their mind, in other words, change the body or wear different clothes or change your name and grow, cut, cut your hair or grow your hair or, you know, all these physical things. And so we've tried that approach and it hasn't been working. It's been making matters worse because she can't accomplish the gender goals. So I'm wondering if, if you know or have any expertise or there's something, some type of therapy um, that could help somebody who's suffering from gender dysphoria understand, and also bipolar and, you know, is obsessed with the gender stuff, um, so that they could start to learn to accept their situation and, and their life and maybe, you know, be happy and productive again. Um, it's sort of a, it's, it's complicated. Um, I, a, a simple answer to whether or not there is a school of therapy or a group of therapists out there who can deal with the specific problem that you describe, um, the, uh, no. It's too, gender dysphoria is, 
fairly new to the kind of psychological diagnostic world. Um, you know, in the past it was just considered get over it, right? I mean, that was just the old way of thinking about things. The problem with gender dysphoria therapists is that the people who go into that tend to self-select. They're the ones who want to help people transition. Um, there's not a lot of, it's not popular to go into helping people kind of accept that their body has to be the way it is. Um, so with that said, so, so unfortunately the answer is there isn't kind of a specialty in that area. But I mean, without knowing your daughter, there are probably a lot of things, uh, some of which I talked about today, um, related to acceptance. Um, like the, the first thing that comes to mind is what's called acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, and mindfulness is a component of that. And it, it, it's kind of help, it would help her sort of identify what's most important to her in her life. Um, and I'm simplifying it quite a bit, but to help her identify which things she needs to accept and which things she can change and work towards. Um, I'm not sure how much emotional dysregulation occurs around the gender dysphoria. A lot. Yeah, a lot. In which case, she can still learn a lot of emotion regulation skills. You know what I mean? In, in very difficult, painful situations, we don't have to get emotionally totally dysregulated. So she can still kind of learn some of the skills that I talked about. And, and you can sort of put it to help her kind of put together things that way. Does that yeah, make no, sense at all? Sense. I mean, I think the thing that adds to the difficulty is when you're really um, disturbed again, for lack of a better mm -hmm. word. Um, so she was after being inpatient in Chart Mesa Vista, she did two months, which is unusual, of a 30-day program. So she repeated the 30-day program twice at COG, um, and she went uh, from five days a week down to four, and then down to three um, in a half-day program. So it was very intensive at COG, and you know, I got the book that that you know she, you get a book when you do COG, and she never opened it. You know, she did a lot of sleeping mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in the the COG therapy, and so one of the things that her psychiatrist said, you know, is, is you know, it's the old joke of like, how many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? And then the answer is one, it just has to want to be changed. And when you have this, um, this kind of um, uh, OCD problem, you know, you're going in and you're saying, no, I'm, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body, and you're, it's not, the work part of it is gone, because that's not a goal you want to work for. Whereas, her, her psychiatrist said, you know, if a patient comes in and says, I'm, you know, homosexual, but I want to be heterosexual, I want to have a family, and, and you know, this is my dream, then that person maybe wants something different and, and could be worked on. So I guess the question is, you know, someone who's going to be resistant to medication um, by taking it, compliant but refractory, um, you know, how can we find someone to, to maybe help? Like, you know, when we interview a therapist, any gender specialist, like you said, is self-selecting, and they're like, oh, we can get her in here, we can help her transition, and do it, but that's not the goal. <laughs> so, so what do we look for? How do we find um, I might start with kind of identifying, uh, you know, setting the gender dysphoria aside, that issue aside, what, she, what, what is most impairing? Right? Is it her emotional dysregulation? Is it her suicidal um, gestures? Is it, you know, is it depression? Or is it her anxiety? And, uh, and and identify what's most impairing, and then identify the most effective treatment for that particular thing. And the gender dysphoria will be incorporated into it, but for example, you know, if, if it's depression, if it's kind of a chronic depression, and um, she has thoughts like, well, I'm never going to be a man, so I might as well kill myself. I might as well die. That is a, a, a very obvious distortion in thinking. There is, there, there's, a various, uh, there's a very obvious kind of cognitive uh, problem there, right? Um, it's not necessarily a rational thought. A more rational thought is, I want to be a man. I'm, I'm, I'm facing 
severe obstacles achieving this goal, and I need to figure out how to get through my day to day while I struggle with this, right? I mean, she can still say life sucks. I wouldn't disagree with that, but I can't be a man, so I should die. That is, you, so there, something like CBT can help. As, as I'm just using that as an example. I'm not sure what's most impairing to her, but I would identify what that is and then find the treatment for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other question? Yeah. How do you know this, uh, whether or not the cognitive, the CBT, or the DBT would be more effective for the person? Um, if, if, if it's someone who is very chronically suicidal and self-harming, um, the more obvious, uh, most people will say DBT. Um, also, if the person is very emotionally dysregulated, like just these extreme mood swings, um, again, most likely DBT. If it's someone who's depressed or anxious, um, and that's kind of a fairly consistent state, you know, someone who's just depressed for weeks, months, then I might recommend cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, for things like OCD, generalized anxiety, panic, if, if that is the thing that you want to target first, then I would say CBT. Does that, I'm kind of guessing, if you give me a description of the problem, then I might. Sure, sure. Uh, 25 years of mostly depression and various uh, slumps, never really manic, then suddenly, boom, all of a sudden a manic episode that was just astronomical followed by a really deep depression. Mm -hmm. Brand new world. Now where did we go? You mean the mania was a brand new world? Um, one episode of mania? Six months long, followed by Severe so depression. Six months of depression. Yeah, therapy-wise, I would probably go with cognitive behavioral therapy um, or mindfulness. Yeah. If it's a fairly kind of predict, you know, like if it's someone you know they're going to wake up tomorrow and be depressed, and they're going to wake up in two days and be depressed, you know, I would go CBT or mindfulness. If it's someone you never know what they're going to look like the next day, um, DBT. So many of them say they do all those things. So how do you know yeah. who's really who's really good at you know more of a specialist in one or one or the yeah, other? Yeah. Well, the thing is, uh, you know, I'll tell you, I do a lot of them. Um, they don't have to be just doing the one thing. Um, a lot of the uh, research, the evidence-based treatments are. Um, there's, there's some amount of overlap, and so it's, I, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, count someone out because they do multiple. I mean, if it was, if, if it's someone that does CBT and also union analysis, that might, that would look a little weird to me, because um, they're just two totally different training tracks. Um, but someone who does CBT, DBT, ACT, you know, those kinds of things, um, it's easy It's easy for that to happen. So I would be more interested in how much, you know, CBT they've done for, if it's OCD you're trying to treat, I would want to know how much CBT have you done for OCD? Or how much CBT have you done for panic attacks? Thank you. Mm -hmm. It totally depends. And I would say even the same person at some point in their life might benefit from a man and a later point might benefit from a woman. It just, it just totally depends on what the problem is, what the issue is, um, and whether it's a good fit beyond gender. Yeah. I mean, some, some people, you know, there's a lot of anxiety around the opposite sex or whatever, and I, I may feel like they're not ready to overcome that anxiety. It's going to be too inhibiting for therapy, in which I say, in which case I'll say, you know, you should probably see a woman. 
if it's a if it's a person who has a lot of anxiety about males, um, but I feel like they're at a point where they could learn to overcome that anxiety and it would be a growing experience, then I might say, you know, I think it's yeah, a male therapist would be best. And again, it could change within the same person. Um, EMDR is very, very, very similar to what's called um, exposure and response prevention. So if you're looking for something, I mean, I would say you could go with either EMDR or uh, exposure and response prevention if, if, if it's trauma or anxiety that uh, you're looking to address. They're, they're very similar. So it wouldn't have to be an EMDR specialist. If you could find someone who did um, exposure and response prevention, which is a variation of CBT. Yeah. Uh -huh. Are there specific questions that a parent might ask a therapist, just being that they're not you know, involved personally? I would ask a lot of the same questions that you would want to know for yourself. You know, if you were the if you were the client, like how much experience you have, you know, how much experience you have treating this or that. But the, the I think the additional component is how involved will I get to be? How much will you share with me? Um, how much will we be checking in with each other? I just I hear too often that the parents drop the kids off and the therapist goes into the room with the child and they never know what's. On. What about follow-up questions with the child to you know, understand? You, you say that you know, oftentimes kids go and they're, they're uh, not so happy about that. So is there some, you know, are there plenty of questions you can ask the child if you know things are going well or um, um, checking with them? That usually comes more from observations of, the, of your observations of the child. So oftentimes kids will come in every week they put up a fight, but they're still getting better. Um, so, and they may even not say that they're getting better because they don't want to admit that you might be right in bringing them to therapy. But um, it, it would be based more on their observation. The kids, I mean, sometimes kids are not so resistant, and then you can ask them, you know, how do you think it's going? What do you like and not like about this therapist? But the kids who are just really, really resistant, um, you're not going to get that much productive information. It's mostly observing, you know, are they getting better? And don't make them admit it. <laughs> so um, let's say we're looking for a therapist. We, we decided that we want to go with CBT. Um, we pick up the phone book. We start looking. Well, I guess that's passe. But anyway, you, you go wherever you go. Um, what sort of questions do you ask on the phone to see if this is even someone you want to start with or try? It's hard because, I mean, you could ask them, like, how they, what their approach is. I mean, you, they'll say CBT, but you could get a sense of, um, you know, CBT done in its very kind of classic form involves homework and practicing things. Um, so you could ask something like that. Um, but I, I will say it's, it's not easy over the phone. To, to really know, and that's because of what I was saying earlier about wanting a good fit. Um, you can't always know that until you're in the room with them. On the phone, you may it may again be obvious that it's not a good fit. It's much easier to know when it's not a good fit. Um, but you could ask them, you know, if, if depression, like, can you tell me about how you work with patients who, you know, clients are, who are depressed? Um, how do you use CBT? Do you assign homework? Um, you know. Do they treat other kind of um, problems with CBT? Um, I would, you know, for someone who has had a manic episode, I would want to know how much experience they have with bipolar disorder, just because it's not exactly the same thing, even if they'll be focusing on depression itself. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's important to know, it's important for a therapist to have experience with, let's say, warning signs, kind of knowing when someone's getting manic. Um, or showing kind of signs of hypomania. I'm trying to narrow it from the, this down to five or six yeah. and then start working. It's hard. It is hard. I, it, yeah. 
Ideally, there would be like a Yelp for therapists, but unfortunately, there isn't. So it's very hard. Yeah. <clears throat> how much would you? How important would you say is like having a similar cultural background with the therapist and the patient? Is that like a big factor? Or? That really depends on what on the individual. Um, if it's something that let's say you felt was really important that you wanted someone that was going to understand your cultural background like i'm korean if i was struggling if i felt like that was a factor in my feeling depressed and i wanted someone who could really understand that then i would look for that but if i'm depressed about um if i'm depressed and my biggest stressor is i don't know finding a job or something like that and i didn't feel like my culture cultural background was really playing a big part in that then i wouldn't say then i would say it's not so relevant yeah, it really just kind of depends. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, when is group therapy a, a good thing to try? Um, it's I, I, it's a very often recommended for like social anxiety. Um, if we're talking about depression, mania, mood disorders, um, if it's the kind of thing. If it's a situation where the person is isolated, needs kind of a little bit more socialization, um, then I might recommend it. Group therapy is, uh, it's not necessarily more effective than individual therapy in certain situations. It's, I mean, it's, it, 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 oftentimes it exists because of the way insurance companies um, pay for things. So, the, I mean, when I really push groups are when I feel like they need kind of more interaction with other people. Um, not necessarily because I feel like group therapy is more effective in certain situations for a mood disorder. Does that make sense? That yeah. 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 I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Did you have any resource, uh, like free counseling or the counseling that we could use? That would be very helpful. Uh, like so free... Free resources. Tr like tre like uh, intervention resources? Yeah. Like or groups and... Resources, counseling, something that we could use. For low income? Yeah. Do you want to answer that? I don't know what that's much about. Yeah, and Debbie can feel free to chime in. Um, we are a group that refers to other groups. So some people actually came here tonight from a really great group called DBSA. And DBSA recommended that they come here. There's another group called NAMI. Have you, are you familiar with those? N-A-M-I, NAMI. And um, those um, offer, while not professional counseling necessarily, they have peer-to-peer -peer counseling. And they have, uh, which means somebody who is struggling with bipolar disorder and who's learned to live healthy with it um, can help kind of mentor that person and walk through that with them. And they also have um, resources for families, too. So they have a lot of really great resources. They meet all over San Diego, probably not in enough locations and not in enough times. We were just discussing with someone here about you know, needing something on the weekend or something that was more bus accessible. Um, but they're two great organizations that um, that you can um, get to. And I, my understanding is that some of the organizations, um, they can help those um, youth apply for, if they're low income, for um, government assistance or for you know, medical, medical assistance. And because they've had to do it for themselves. So they can walk through the process. A lot of times, um, people who are having severe episodes can't work. And so they've had to apply for all of those things. And sometimes a peer can help you with the insurance and, and find you um, places. And so those are two really good local resources. But um, since I, I'm just so inspired that all four of you are here, I would like to maybe have you get together with Debbie or our staff. And maybe we can put together a packet of information like that that we could give to other people. Mm -hmm. And for people who have, um, 
uh, Medicare, Medi-Cal, uh, UCSD has uh, the Gifford Clinic, um, John Ann Homecrest. They have to live somewhat in that area, um, but there they have, you can get psychiatric services, um, therapy. Yeah, I, I just learned of a program that they are doing at UCSD for youth, and they take them in small groups. I forget what it's called, but I do have their card, so I'll get it for you, but it's a, they're providing it for youth. Yeah, there's a taste for, it's called, uh, how it stands for, but it is for that age range, yeah. um, transition age mm -hmm. youth or something like that. Yeah, that's also at the same. It's out of the same location. Yeah. You know, and I did have a question for you. Uh, I was raising my hand, and thank you for asking the question about cultural differences, because I was thinking of things like religion or spirituality. You know, do I want to see a Jewish therapist or a Christian one, or maybe somebody um, who has no faith base? like that matches, but I think you answered that really well. Um, but you talked a great deal about um, how to find the right therapist. When is it time to switch? When is it not working or when is it not a good match? Um, when, it, when would be a, an idea and how would you do that transition and switch from one person to another? Why, you know, I hear that as a very common theme in a lot of the people that I meet, a lot of books that I read that they were with one person and they, it just wasn't working so they switched and, and it was life-changing for them to get to the right therapist. Yeah, I wouldn't say there's a necessarily an easy answer to that. I mean, I would always kind of bring it up with the therapist and first say, you know, I'm kind of feeling like, I don't know, maybe I should make a switch. What do you think? And, and, and talk about it. Um, but aside from that, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about therapy being a little bit of work. Um, it needs to feel like you're it actually needs to feel a little bit like you're struggling, you know, struggling with something, and kind of um, not just uh, stagnant. Um, it needs to feel like you're going through some process of change, even if it is a little bit slow. So if it starts to feel, if, if you've gone too long without feeling like you're working, um, then, then that's usually a, a good time to kind of bring that up. Questions. So I just want to thank everyone for being here tonight and hope that you will join us at our next event. Um, and we'll check online if you're not in our database, you can sign up and um, be notified of our next lecture. And I just wanted to also thank Eunice very much for her time. And she does offer in, in Del Mar and also in LA. So if you're looking for a therapist, the right fit could be in. <laughs> Thank you.